So back in February, I did my whole annual Fire Emblem thing, where I made a bunch of videos talking about this Japanese strategy RPG that stars a bunch of blue-haired members of anime royalty, and who often have to save a kingdom and slay some sort of god or a dragon, or sometimes a god dragon. After two years of doing this, I've covered just about every single main title in the series, or at least the remake of it, but there was one game in particular this year that I avoided, and that was the second game in the series, Fire Emblem Gaiden. Gaiden was a game on Nintendo's Famicom, and like most Famicom games, it's old, boopy, and a little weird in its overall execution. I chose not to play Gaiden as part of my Japanese Fire Emblem theme this year for a couple reasons, the main one being time. I was already playing several other full-length Fire Emblem games for the month, and because of Gaiden's obsolete setup and the general weirdness that the game had when compared to other Fire Emblem games, I just didn't have the time to play it all the way through. I had to get this stuff out for February, after all. I was on schedule. I didn't want to be late. And we can see how well that turned out. Luckily for me, I was given their chance. In the midst of ranked Fire Emblem February, Nintendo announced a remake of Fire Emblem Gaiden for the Nintendo 3DS. And it wasn't gonna quite be like playing a page out of history or anything, but it was close enough. This is Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia. Fire Emblem Echo Shadows of Valentia is the 15th game in the Fire Emblem series and the third game on the Nintendo 3DS. It's also a remake of Fire Emblem Gaiden, the second game in the series. With that on the table, please know that this is a review of the remake and the remake alone, so if I mention things that are in this game that also exist in Gaiden, or if I mention things that are in this game that are in Gaiden that I don't talk about, I don't really care, because that's not what I'm talking about today. The game takes place in the same world as the hero King Marth, but far away from the land of the blue-haired hero. Instead, our tale takes place on the continent of Valentia, a land that split into the two major kingdoms of Regal and Zofia. Long ago, prior to the start of the game, there existed a pair of dragon siblings that just couldn't play nice, so just like any other sitcom duo, they separated and drew a line down the middle of their room, with Duma ruling the lands in the north, and Mila ruling the lands in the south. Our story begins in Zofia with a young boy named Alm. Alm lives in a village within Zofia along with his grizzled badass knight of a grandfather, and also with his childhood friend and future so official couple is on the front of the box love interest, Selica. Life's just dandy for Alm and his friends, until one day they run into a group of knights in the woods who just decide they are gonna ruin these kids' day. Kinda makes you wonder why this guy is such a jackass, but then you realize he's probably got some pent up issues growing up with those T-Rex arms of his. Alm's grandfather shows up and kicks those sorry good-for-nothings right out of town, but realizes the knights recognize Selica for who she actually is, the Princess of Zofia, and thus she can't stay in the village anymore. So he whisks her away the next day while she and Alm have a heartfelt goodbye, vowing to reunite in the future. Three guesses to what happens next. Flash forward several years and Alm's grown into a fine young swordsman trained by his grandfather, but is still not allowed to leave the town for undisclosed reasons. But then he does it anyway, cause why not, we need a story. Meanwhile, Selica has a dream about her childhood boyfriend getting stabbed, and also decides to go do something about the climate change that's threatening the continent, so she too sets out on a journey of her own. The story then splits the focus between Alm and Selica as they try to achieve their goals, slowly bringing them closer and closer together for a common purpose of saving their land. Shadows of Valentia is a Fire Emblem game, but being a remake of a game like Gaiden, it stands as being a much different beast than its predecessors. At its base, Shadows of Valentia has all the same core gameplay mechanics and principles that every other Fire Emblem has. Battles are turn-based, every unit has a set of individual stats that determine their worth as a human being. And unless you're playing in casual mode, character death is permanent, save for the use of special in-game devices that can resurrect the dead. However, while it is certainly a Fire Emblem game, Shadows of Valencia differentiates itself from standard Fire Emblem in so many ways. The main one being that Shadows of Valencia plays less like an episodic chapter by chapter game like almost every other Fire Emblem, and instead plays more like an adventure RPG with Alm and Selica traversing an overworld map, visiting towns for info and supplies, storming castles, and exploring dungeons for gear. You see, there was this weird period back when classic NES slash Famicom games were getting sequels where for some reason developers felt like the second game not only had to be different from the first, it had to be so different that when you go to school to pick it up at the car rider line, you sit there raging at the chaperones for 10 minutes because you can't recognize your baby anymore and you think they lost it. There was also this trend back then where a few Nintendo games tried to incorporate dungeon crawling RPG elements into their sequels. Games like Legend of Zelda where they went from a top down adventure dungeon crawler to a side scrolling action game with stats and levels and a shoddy English translation. 
or Castlevania, which started with an action platformer and then went to an action platformer with RPG elements and a shoddy English translation. And you know, Fire Emblem didn't come to us here during the NES era, but I bet if it had, then Lucas probably would have shown up in all of Village speaking broken English. Though, I do gotta admit, while these games have a questionable reputation in some circles, you gotta at least give these developers credit for trying to do something so new, even if it didn't always work out. Regardless, instead of playing the game chapter by chapter, Alm and Celica instead traverse an overworld map as they make their way towards their objectives. At first the game forces you to play as Alm, but after a certain point in the story you get to switch over to playing as Celica for a while before the two are finally reunited, and then separated, at which point you can freely choose to pursue either character's individual quest, but will inevitably end up bringing them back together anyway late in the story. While traveling on the map, you can get into fights with various groups of enemies, and making contact with one will bring you into a battle where you can defeat them all to win. Some of these fights are story related and thus have to be done in order to advance the plot, but there's also some roaming and respawning enemies on the map that you can either choose to fight or avoid. If I'm being honest, you'll probably end up fighting these suckers anyway though, because there isn't a ton of deviation on the intended path of the maps, you more or less go in a straight line from one point to the other. Other than fighting, Alm and Celica can also stop at towns and forts. Once inside, they do their best Phoenix Wright impression by being able to talk to people, examine objects, and act like a giant kleptomaniac by picking up anything that isn't nailed down like weapons and food. You know, I keep running into people who are starving in these towns, and I'm starting to see why that might happen. You people need to invest in pantries and bicycle locks. You can also visit dungeons in the overworld map, places where the game takes a dramatic shift in gameplay by suddenly becoming a 3D dungeon crawler a la Persona. You get to control all of Marcelica and run around scavenging for loot and occasionally having to fight monsters. If you get into a fight, you'll get sucked into a quick battle and then after you finish, you go right on your merry way of exploring. Also in a similar vein to games like Persona, you can attack these wandering monsters before going into the fight to gain an advantage over them. But if they land a hit on you first, you'll be the one at the disadvantage. And other games do this too, I'm sure, but I've been playing Persona 5 for the last month, so that's just the most relevant comparison I can make at the moment. Makoto is best girl. Like any respectable RPG, dungeons are a place of exploration and loot. The main purpose of romping through these areas are to find new items that will make your units stronger, sweet cash you can use in towns to forge weapons, and various other goodies. You can also use these areas for grinding for XP or loot if it fits your fancy, since they feature constantly respawning enemies. You can't stay in a dungeon forever though, because everyone has an individual fatigue meter, something reminiscent of... that... game. If you start to get tired, they'll start fighting with reduced stats and thus more likely get killed, so you gotta weigh your options about how long you want to stay in these places. There's still a lot to this game other than just dungeon crawling though, I mean what would a Fire Emblem be without micromanaging half a dozen anime teenagers and turning them into unstoppable killing machines? With that said, Shadows of Valencia does try to mix up the formula a little bit to give it a more of a fresh, unique feel. The actual combat in Shadows of Valentia is pretty different from other Fire Emblem games in more recent years. There were several mechanics and game elements that were either reworked or axed completely. For starters, the game completely threw out the weapon triangle, which was the rock, paper, scissors mechanic that pretty much every single other Fire Emblem game had. It no longer matters if you're using a sword and the bad guy uses an axe, you're not getting an additional advantage over him. But thankfully, this goes both ways. Another thing I got overhaul was equipable weapons, and in other Fire Emblem games everybody had an equipable weapon and in most games those weapons had durability. You use a sword one too many times and it would break, at which point you need to grab another one or else you're SOL. Even enemies had this problem, which is why sometimes you see some dude carrying like five axes, like this one general. Why you got all those axes, huh buddy? Something you know that I don't? Is there a, is there a lumberjack convention in town? Hey you can tell us, everybody digs pancakes. Face did away with weapon durability, instead gave us weapons with more unique properties, which was something that I personally liked, but I know that some other people didn't. Shadows of Valentia took it a step further though by pretty much eliminating the necessity to equip weapons altogether. Now characters just inherently have weapons tailored to their class that they could use to fight. No need to stick a sword or an axe on somebody, they already got one. Of course, that's not to say that there isn't still equipment or that isn't important. Au contraire. Equipment seems to be more important than ever now. While everyone does get a built-in weapon as part of their class and character, you can still equip a weapon to them to give them increased stats and other benefits. If a character uses a certain piece of equipment long enough, they'll get special skills associated with it that will give a variety of advantages. So say you give somebody a leather shield, well that person will get increased defense from physical attacks like you'd expect them to. Then if they hold onto that shield long enough and get into enough fights with it, they'll learn a unique skill they can use that lets them swap positions with a friendly adjacent unit on the battlefield. 
Basically, what I'm saying is that equipment is really important in Shadows of Valentia because aside from boosting their stats from holding weapons, units get awesome skills that will make them more viable and powerful overall. It's an interesting system that has a little bit more depth than just giving someone a sword because it has high attack power. You might want to give them a special sword that has a unique skill that would expand their given role on the battlefield. Other than weapons though, there's also a bunch of other different mechanics like how mages and clerics now have to use their own health to cast spells, with the power of the spell determining how much health they use. Luckily they can't suicide themselves if they get down to 1 HP, but it's still something you gotta watch out for. Ginny used blood magic to die for your sins. I hope you're grateful, you monster. Arches are another class that are different. Now they have insane range in their bows, firing up to five spaces away at both the two or three that they could before. They can even shoot someone in the face that gets right up to attack them at close range. And when they promote, they get even more range as a sniper. Archers are now basically living ballista. Finally, there's one more gameplay gimmick in this game that I almost forgot to include in this review, and quite frankly, that's because I keep forgetting about the damn thing myself while playing the actual game. Alm and Selica both have access to a special device called Mila's Turn Wheel, a neat trinket that lets you turn back the tide of time in a battle. Have you ever been playing a game and been like, whoops, made a mistake, wish I could go back like 5 seconds so that guy didn't die? It's a mechanic that's been done in other games for sure, but not really in Fire Emblem. Most of the time if we screw up, we just reset the whole chapter or reload a save. Well, Mila's Turn Wheel averts that. With this, you can rewind a few actions in a fight once per battle to get another shot at something. The number of actions that you go back to are determined by these little cogs you find in dungeons and towns, so it's yet another reason to visit these places. It's a neat mechanic overall, but like I said, it's something I honestly keep forgetting exists. And it's not the fault of the game that's the problem, it's just more the fact that for me personally, Fire Emblem has conditioned me to the point where if I make a huge mistake, I immediately hit the reset button. There's been a lot of changes to what we would call the standard for Fire Emblem with Shadows of Valentia, but honestly, I think most of the changes are good. Of course, I don't like all of them. Well, let's not waste any time here. I'm personally not a fan of the dungeon crawling in Shadows of Valentia. The dungeons are probably one of the most standout features of this game that's set apart from other Fire Emblem titles. If I'm being honest, I kind of find them more annoying and a tad tedious rather than exciting and fun. For starters, there's just how enemy encounters work. Running into enemies in dungeons pretty much works how it would in any other dungeon crawling JRPG where you get sucked into an encounter and then have to kick their ass before going on your merry way. But while the game does follow that formula, there is one factor that really separates it from other similar examples, and that would be the length of the battles. In another JRPG, an encounter with an enemy patrol will be over in about 30 seconds. It's usually to the point where you get really sick of hearing the same entrance of the game's battle theme 500 times. In Shadows of Valentia though, the battle takes significantly longer. Battles in dungeons usually take about 5-10 minutes at minimum, and can go even longer than that if enemy patrols got sucked into the encounter. You might not think that's a long enough time to complain about, but it really starts to creep up on you after a while. As such, dungeons become a bit of a hassle with having to stop, fight, move forward a bit, then possibly fight again in the next room. Even just using dungeons for grinding XP doesn't really feel like it's worth it since the XP you get feels minuscule anyway. The good news is that it seems that most dungeons on the overall map are optional and you don't even have to go to them if you don't want to. You should though, since that's where the best gear is, but ultimately it is your choice which is also a nice option. There's also the fact that dungeons are relatively short and the enemy ratio in rooms is kinda small. But the bad news is that if you ever want to promote your units, you're gonna be going to dungeons a lot because that's the most common places to do it. Promotion in Shadows of Valentia requires you to take your characters to the Shrines of Mila, which are mostly found within dungeons. Anytime a character can promote, you have to take them to a statue. Every. Single. Time. Although I admit that it's an interesting narrative device since the character is essentially praying to this divine dragon goddess person or whatever to make themselves stronger, it doesn't take away from the fact that if I want to promote a unit, I have to fight my way past respawning enemies in the overworld map, find a dungeon, fight my way past respawning enemies in the dungeon, or just sprint past them but risk running into one since the draw distance for spotting them isn't very far, and then reach the statue to have that unit promote. 
Also, I can only take 10 units into a dungeon at a time, so I better make sure I take everyone I'm promoting with me, because if I leave someone out, I gotta go all the way out of the dungeon to get them before going back in. And yes, there are a few locations that have shrines of meal on the map that are not dungeons, and those are definitely ideal for promoting. But that doesn't eliminate the problem having to fight my way through roaming enemy patrols on the map while going to that shrine and back, because as I said before, the maps are linear so there really isn't a good way to avoid patrols. Not to mention that these non-dungeon shrines are often spread out so far apart from each other that it would ultimately be faster to just sprint through a nearby dungeon. I'm not really a fan of the overall map or dungeons in Shadows of Valentia, but I mean I do appreciate while there is something different in this game, just the different parts are just kind of tedious. But hey, you know what? That's okay, because the rest of the game has been pretty great. I'm enjoying myself. I'm having a good time. And also, I'm pretty damn impressed with the presentation of the game. If there's one thing I was very surprised and actually pretty impressed with when it comes to Shadows of Valentia, it's the presentation of the game's story and its characters. The character writing and overall plot are pretty engaging to me, and I can really say there haven't been any party members that I've gotten that have rubbed me the wrong way. Typically there's one or two characters in my army that I just can't stand, but honestly I haven't really run into anybody like that in Shadows of Valentia. Characters aren't just one note, they have the depth of them. Well, maybe except Faye. Seriously Alm, you need to run for the hills buddy. For that matter, I was also very surprised to find out that pretty much 90% of the game features full voice acting. Pretty much every single character that has a portrait in Shadows of Lentia has a voice to go along with it, and they use it all the time. First Breath of the Wild, and now this? Welcome to the frickin' 21st century, Nintendo. Could've used you back in the early 2000s, though. Supports are also here, which is always a welcome sight for me, though I think it's interesting that the support conversations now happen like they did back in the Game Boy Advance era, that being the two characters will engage in their dialogue while on the battlefield itself. I don't really mind it that much, but it can get a little ridiculous while in the middle of fighting off the entire enemy army, and Claire and Grey are talking about their love life so casually. They expect her to swoon the moment you offer up your love. Yeah, but... but I do love you. No. You do not. In conclusion, I like Shadows of Lentia. I think this game is great. I'm having a great time. It's lots of fun. Yeah, there's a few tedious aspects of the dungeon crawling that I'm not a fan of, but it's not souring my experience overall. In terms of rating, I would give it a... I like it. Out of 10. Face is always a bright spot in my day. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, but don't worry. I drank a bunch of tea, so I'm ready to kill in your name. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs>